what's up everybody welcome back moving on to another polynomial inequality example so we have this polynomial f of x here x to the 4 minus 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 12x minus 8 and we have to solve two inequalities so when is this uh, polynomial greater than 0 when is it greater than or equal to 0 and you may be asking yourself what's the real difference because before Whenever we had perhaps, let's say, a solution like x is greater than 3 or something like this, if it was just asking us when is it greater than or equal to 0, then the solution would be that. So wouldn't the solutions for this one be the same? We would just take these solutions and then just add this equal sign to the inequalities. But you can always make that assumption, and I'm going to show you why with this specific polynomial that we are given. Things can get a little bit more tricky. So what we got to do is first we got to take this polynomial, like usual, we have to factor it. So can we take any constants out? No. Can we take any variables out? No. So we're going to have to do the factor theorem. So we're going to have to plug in a bunch of numbers, like f of 1. If we plug in 1 for all of the x values, notice that we would get 0, right? 1 minus 3 minus 2 plus 12 minus 8, those would all net out to 0. So since f of 1 is 0, we know that x minus 1 is a factor. So what we got to do is we got to take x minus 1 and divide it into that polynomial x to the 4 minus 3x to the 3 um, minus 2x squared plus 12x minus 8. And when we do that long division we end up getting x to the power of 3 minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 8 as the quotient. Notice how the remainder we got is 0 which makes sense because x minus 1 is a factor. So basically, what we've done so far, we've taken this polynomial, split it up into x minus 1, and then x cubed minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 8. So now what we have to do is we have to take this remaining cubic in the bracket and factor it. And since it's a degree greater than 2, we can't just use decomposition like we would for quadratics. So perhaps we can use factor theorem, and factor theorem would work again, so plugging in plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, etc., etc., until we get something equaling 0. But with cubics, you always want to look if you can potentially do it by grouping. And notice that if we write out this cubic function, notice how we can factor by grouping. From the first two, we can take out an x squared, so we'd be left with x minus 2. And then from here, we could take, uh, take out a negative 4. So we'd be left with x minus 2. So we could take out an x minus 2 then. And then we'd be left with x squared minus 4. And then notice how this is a difference of squares. So we got x minus 2, x plus 2, x minus 2. Right? So it's a lot quicker to do it by grouping, and you always want to look for that when you get to a cubic function. It's not going to work all the time. In this case, it does work. And you can also do it the long way. So if you plugged in 2 or negative 2, for example, into this cubic, you would get 0. And then you can use one of these factors, do the long division, get a remaining quadratic as the quotient, factor that. But you'd end up with the same answer anyway. So. Basically, this cubic factors into these three brackets, x minus 2, x plus 2, and then x minus 2. Now, notice how the x minus 2s, they are the same. So we got x minus 1, x plus 2, and then the x minus 2s, we can just write x minus 2 squared. Right? So now what we can do is we can graph this. And this has a degree of 4, positive leading coefficient, positive 1. So we know the end behaviors are going to be from quadrant 2 to quadrant
quadrant one. The y-intercept, if we plug in zero for all the x's, either here or here, it's easier to do it in the expanded form. We get a y-intercept of negative eight. And then what are the x-intercepts gonna be? Uh, we got one here, negative two, and then positive two. So we got negative two, then we got positive one, and then we got positive two. So how's this gonna look like? Well, it's gonna look something like this. And then notice when we get to this two here, it has an order of two. What does that mean? If you remember from the previous unit, it means it bounces, right? Off the x-axis at that uh, x value of two. Right, so this is the graph. And if you remember, what was the question asking us? They were uh, asking us, when is this polynomial greater than zero? And then also, when is it greater than or equal to zero? And I mentioned that the solutions to both of these are gonna be fairly unique. So let's start off with greater than zero. Well, when is this greater than zero? Well, it's greater than zero here, right? When x is less than negative two, it's greater than zero here when x is between one and two, and it's also greater than zero here when x is greater than two. So the answers to this inequality would be when x is less than negative two, when x is between one and two, or when x is greater than two. And notice how it's not inclusive of any of the intercepts because it's just asking us when is it greater than zero, not when is it greater than or equal to zero, which we're gonna figure out over here. Now let's move on to the next one. When is it greater than or equal to zero? Well, it's gonna be the same intervals, but now it's gonna be inclusive of the intercepts. So let's start off with this one. Basically, when x is less than or equal to negative two, this function will be greater than or equal to zero, right? Add an x value negative two, the y value zero. It's also gonna be greater than or equal to zero here. So when x is between one and two, but inclusive of the one and two, so similar to here, but inclusive of those endpoints. And when x is greater than or equal to two. Right, so right here. Same thing as here, we just put this equal sign because it's now inclusive of the two. So, is this answer correct here? Well, there's a bit of a problem. Notice how with these two intervals, we've included an x value of two twice, right? Because in this interval, we have x is greater than or equal to two, and then in this interval, we have x is less than or equal to two. So we're including that x value of two twice in these intervals, and you can't have the same x value when you are writing different intervals. So if you think about it, we can actually take these two intervals and we can write it as one. X is greater than one, right? So the answer to this question, to this inequality, is when x is less than or equal to negative two and when x is greater than or equal to one. So that was the trick in this question is we sort of combine these two when we did this because if you think about it, they're asking us when is this function greater than or equal to zero? Well, notice that for all of the x values that are greater than one, the function's gonna be greater than or equal to zero. It's either gonna have a positive y value or a y value of zero. So we don't actually have to split this interval up into two parts because it bounces at this point and keeps going, right? So it's never gonna be negative after an x value of one. So we can just say that this function is greater than or equal to zero when x is greater than or equal to one. So we took those two intervals that we wrote before and combine them. 
However, notice with this one, we do have to split it up because this one is asking us when is the function only greater than zero, not when is it greater than or equal to zero. So when it hits a y value of zero, we can't include that in the intervals. So we have to split it up between one and two here and when x is greater than two, right? But when they're asking us greater than or equal to zero, we don't have to worry about this x value because it's just bouncing off. It's not being negative after. So we just have to write x is greater than or equal to one for that interval. So fairly tricky. I wanted to bring it up because it may come up uh, in your homework, may come up on your test as well. You gotta be careful with these bounces here. Sometimes, especially when they're asking you when is it less than or equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero, you're not going to have to include a certain x-intercept uh, when you're writing the intervals out. Not always, but sometimes, like in this case. But if they're asking you when is it greater than zero or less than zero without that equal sign, usually you are going to have to split it up at every x-intercept. And if you were to do this with a sign chart, same thing like we've done before, you basically write out the x-intercepts from lowest to highest with the negative infinity, positive infinity at the end. And then these rows here are gonna be the factors. Now, the difference here, we haven't dealt with this yet, is whenever you have a factor x minus two squared, you write x minus two squared here, right? And then you just pick numbers in between. So between negative infinity and negative two, so negative three between negative two and one, zero, between one and two, maybe 1.5, here maybe three. So negative three minus one, negative number, negative number. Notice how this, no matter what is in the bracket, we're gonna square it, it's always gonna be a positive. So we could just write positive for the whole row there, right? If we plug in zero, this would be negative, this would be positive. 1.5, this would be positive, this would be positive, and then three, positive and positive. So if we multiply everything here, we get a positive sign here, we get a negative sign, here we get a positive sign and a positive sign. Notice how these two positive signs, they are uh, consecutive, right? And that makes sense because at that x value of two, the function bounced as we saw in the graph. So same thing, when is this function going to be greater than uh, zero? Not greater than or equal to zero, just greater than zero. Well, in this interval here, so if we write it in set notation, x is an element between negative infinity and negative two, Next interval would be here between one and two. And then the other interval, uh, interval would be from two to positive infinity. Right? What about the other one? When x is greater than or equal to zero. Well, it's gonna be greater than or equal to zero here, when x is less than or equal to negative two, or between negative infinity and negative two, so x is an element between negative infinity and negative two, but the negative two we put in square brackets, right? And then it's also gonna be greater than or equal to zero for all of the x values after one, right? So in this interval, at two, when it's zero and when x is greater than two. So we don't have to split that interval up, we just have to write when x is greater than or equal to one, like we wrote when we graphed it. So the answer here would be x is from one to positive infinity, and that is a circle bracket, right? And it's inclusive of the one here. So again, we don't have to write that two in between here when we're finding when is f of x greater than or equal to zero like we did here when we were just finding when is it greater than zero, right? So that's a trick that may come up. Be aware of that. Um, 
thought I would show it. Hopefully you got all that. And if you didn't, just maybe rewatch the video one more time. Look at the graph and just make sure you understand the difference between when they're asking when is it greater than zero and when is it greater than or equal to zero.